Don't know the answer? Ask the Naked Scientists. Hello and welcome to this week's Ask the Naked Scientists with me, Sue Marchant and Chris Smith. How is the world of science with you? There's a really nice piece of research which has been published in uh, the journal Current Biology by a researcher at the University of California at San Diego. Beautiful place, I've been there. This particular bit of research is about bees. And uh, it's James Nie, who's a researcher there. And he's discovered basically an element of bee behaviour that people had previously overlooked. Now, one of the most classical things that bees are known to do is something called the waggle dance. And so when a bee discovers where there is a very fertile source of food, it will return to its hive and it then performs this very detailed dance, which researchers have now worked out how to interpret. And what the bee does is it performs in front of other bees, doing various twists and turns, and this reveals to the bees which direction they must fly in and for how long in order to find this very prolific source of food. What the bees also do, though, is if they're out foraging and they come into contact with something dangerous, for instance, a rival bee colony attacks them, or there's some other predator that goes after them, or a human goes after them, in fact, mm -hmm. it marks that area as dangerous. The bee then returns to the hive and it performs a different manoeuvre to warn the bees not to go in that direction. So it will watch other bees, and if it sees a bee doing a waggle dance that would send other bees from the hive off to where the danger spot was, the bee will go up to this other waggle dancing bee, and it will do a headbutt, and it puts its head against the other bee's body. Sometimes it climbs on top of it to do this, and it vibrates its body 380 times a second for a tenth of a second, and this tells the bee, don't do that, and it's a bee stop signal. And Gosh. it tells the bees, don't go in that direction. And the amount that the bees do this is proportional to the level of danger. And so this is a very good way of the bees risk assessing a situation and then exerting a bit of elf and safety and saying, don't go over there because you may become a cropper. So it's ingenious that bees don't just tell each other where to go, they also tell each other where not to go. Wow, that's really quite something. And our first question this evening, Dr Chris, is all about love. Uh, Benedict Hagen, who sent an email in from Norway, has said, how do we fall in love? How does that brain get stimulated? Chris. Um, this is an interesting question because it's only in recent years that we've really got to the bottom of, of what love is and why we fall in love because Brian Ferry famously sang Love is a Drug and I Need to Score and that's effectively what we're doing when we're falling in love with people. We're becoming addicted to them, chemically speaking, and the addiction is not much different than the addiction you get when you get hooked on drugs, in fact. This is what neuroscientists are now telling us. Wow. What we understand about the, that love in feeling is basically that there are a number of key hormonal and chemical players. So one of the key players is a chemical called oxytocin, and this is released from the brain, and it's released from the brain under certain circumstances. One of them is having sex. Having an orgasm produces huge amounts of oxytocin. It goes around the bloodstream. This is very important when babies are born, and this gives us a clue as to part of what love is, because this is how it was discovered, in fact. When a baby's born, as a baby comes out, because the baby stretches a cervix, this triggers the release of this oxytocin. When the baby comes out, the mum loves it, because mum sees baby, mum also has big surge of this chemical oxytocin, which goes into her brain, comes out of the pituitary and goes into the brain, and this is thought to be partly relating to this bonding between the mother and the baby. The same thing probably happens when uh, the man and the woman fall in love because they have sex together, they have orgasms together, this produces more of this oxytocin and this reinforces the bond between them. So the mother-baby bond is also played out in the sort of wife-husband bond or partner-partner -partner bond. So that's one of the chemicals, oxytocin. The other thing that you need in a loving relationship, of course, is faithfulness. And in recent years, scientists have also begun to get some inroads into this because it turns out that there's a chemical called vasopressin. And this is also used as a nerve transmitter in the brain. And when men uh, are exposed to this stuff, it makes them much more macho. It makes them behave in a much more masculine kind of strutting about, puffing up their chest type way. And they tend to become more protective around women and more defensive towards other men. And this seems to foster uh, faithful behaviour, so men are more likely to be faithful to their partner. 
there was a study done in Sweden in the last couple of years where they actually found that uh, the receptor, the chemical docking station that picks up on this vasopressin uh, hormone, uh, this, uh, if you have a different form of this, you may actually be more likely to have marital difficulties. Uh, there are different forms of the receptor, different genes, and people who had had some kind of problems in their marriage were more likely to have a different form of this, at least amongst the men, than... Uh, if people had another form of the receptor. So this strongly argues that, that there's some kind of bonding thing going on with this chemical in terms of how faithful men are. This is also played out in nature because there are two kinds of vole uh, which scientists have been studying. Uh, one vole species is called the meadow vole, and this one is uh, polygamous. It will mate with anything. But there's another vole which is related to it called a prairie vole, which is monogamous. It only partners with one animal, uh, one mate. And you can turn that polygamous meadow vole into the prairie vole if you put more of this vasopressin into its brain. So this strongly suggests that uh, this oxytocin makes you bond with the other person and vasopressin makes you faithful to the other person and then the reward you get from all of that is a little squirt of the, the love drug dopamine too which is the brain's pleasure chemical and uh, when you enjoy someone's company that's dopamine actually making you feel good. So probably love can be reduced to three or just at most a handful of chemicals in the brain I'm afraid. Hmm. Has that taken the romance out? I don't know. Maybe George Clooney does feel the same. Who knows? Time for our next question, then. This time we're going to the phones. And uh, yeah, I think we've got Mark there. Hello, Mark. Hello, Sue. Hello there. Hello, you're, th Dr. Chris. you're through to Dr Chris. What's your Thank question? You, um, the question is, um, I went into Canada uh, a year after Mount St Helens went up in Washington State. And um, I know they couldn't predict that, but it's known the fault in Yellowstone National Park. And I just wanted to know, are the American government, because are they doing anything to sort of vent, try and vent the force? So you're thinking, could we use them to produce energy? Yeah, and energy as well. But, you know, to protect us, is there any way they could vent the pressure from there by drilling or somehow and, and, and venting the pressure off? The problem is that if we intervene there's a real danger that you could actually make things worse, not better. Oh, yeah. Because if you release something that's under pressure, one of the reasons why volcanoes are so explosive and Mount St Helens exploded is because when the volcano goes, what's actually happening is that magma, which is the liquid rock which is rising through the earth, when that comes up through the volcano, it feels much less pressure than it was under deep inside the earth. And this oil. sudden loss of pressure means that gases that are dissolved inside the molten rock no longer can stay dissolved. And it's a bit like a diver who comes up too quickly from deep down in the water. Gas which is dissolved in the blood cannot come out in the lungs quickly enough and it boils out and forms bubbles. And of course the bubbles in the bloodstream take up space and they stop the blood getting through. Well in the context of a volcano these bubbles take up space and they stop the rock getting through and they then cause a devastating explosion. So if the pressure is released too quickly this can actually make a bigger catastrophe than if things stay put and it's gently vented or if it allows to just creep and dissipate the pressure of its own accord. Um, Yellowstone Park is, you're quite right, sitting on a potential super volcano. There's a massive collection of material there and it's definitely on the move because geologists have been tracking it for a long time. They've got quite good data. The evidence is, though, that there's not a lot we can do about this. The Earth has awesome power locked away inside it, and nature is an incredible force. You just have to look at the impact of the tsunami on Boxing Day in 2004 and then more recently what's happened in Haiti to see what actually the Earth can do because of this tremendous amount of energy locked away geologically. And so scientists are working really very hard to try and understand this and to also be able to predict when things might happen because prediction is 90% of the way there because if we can work out when these things are going to happen, we can take steps to make sure no one or as few people as possible get hurt. Unfortunately, with earthquakes, it's really, really difficult to do. With volcanoes, there are some clues, but they're not long-term clues. But we're doing our best. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Now, Chris, another email here. And this has come in from uh, Jackie, who says, uh, Good evening to you both. The moon goes round in a circle each night. What happens to the stars? Do you know, I've often thought that. Chris? Yes, sure. Well, OK, let's think about this. So the Earth is sitting, orbiting the sun and it takes a year for the Earth to go all the way around the Sun. And the Earth is unusual because it has a moon which is really very large, which orbits it. 
and the moon takes about a month to go one complete lap around the Earth. So in other words, if you imagine the moon starting at, say, 9 o'clock on a clock face, and to make its way right round to 9 o'clock again takes about 28 days. Meanwhile, the equation is slightly more complex because the Earth is in itself turning, isn't it? Because the Earth is spinning, taking 24 hours roughly to complete one revolution to get back to where it started. So if you imagine that we start the day, and let's imagine that the moon is at the 9 o'clock position on the clock face, and that's where you are on the Earth's surface looking at it, well, as the day goes on, the moon is going to move across the sky because the Earth is turning. The moon isn't actually moving that much relative to the Earth. It's moving quite slowly, but because the Earth is spinning, therefore it looks like the moon is moving. It hasn't moved that much. You've moved. And come the next day, you'll come back to your... Uh, starting position and the moon will not be at quite nine o'clock it'll have gone round a little bit because it's moved one day closer to completing its orbit um, does that answer the question i think so it does for me thank you very much indeed chris all right let's go to the phones again now because we've got um hazel on the line hello hello hazel oh, how are you oh, not too bad you're not too bad good what's your question for dr chris uh, when i was at school which is a long while ago, and the year, the particular year I tried to work out would be about 43, 44. Mm-hmm. At that particular time, we had a fantastic geography teacher, and one of the lessons was about the ice melting and that that would flood the East Coast and East Anglia because the sea would rise. If, she, if that teacher forecast it then, why is there so much talk about it now? Well, I think probably, Hazel, what the teacher was getting at um, is that if you wind the clock back in Earth's history, there was a time, and it was, I think, about 30, 40 million years ago, when the polar ice caps completely melted. The Earth had no poles. And scientists know that because they've found various core data and various little pebbles and things on the ocean floor, uh, which are indicative of the melting, which took place during a warm time in the Earth's past. So we know the Earth goes through cycles, and they come cyclically, and sometimes the Earth is warmer, sometimes it's colder. And when the Earth was in that warm phase and all that ice melted, then the sea level was a lot higher and there was a lot less land. Also, the land has redistributed itself as well tectonically since then, so things are not quite the configuration they're in today. Um, But things certainly do go through spells of being very, very cold and very icy and then much warmer and very wet. And only about 10,000 years ago, um, if we were making this radio programme in the same places we're all sitting in now, we would all be under an ice sheet because there was an ice sheet, a very big volume of ice, which completely covered the UK, right down as far as about Finchley in London. And that's where the ice sheet ended. And that was as recently as 10,000 years ago. And that then melted away again. And before that, about half a million years ago, East Anglia was actually a mini Mediterranean. Scientists discovered people dating back early, early kind of pre-human uh, activities there, um, dating back about half a million years in Norfolk. Uh, in the last few years. They found that there was evidence of people actually coming up from the Mediterranean because the east coast of Norfolk was very nice and warm. It was, as I say, a mini Mediterranean and there were lots of miniature animals, miniature rhinoceros, miniature elephants. Uh, Effectively, it was dwarf hunting extravaganza and so people came here for their warm holidays. It is a reality that things are warming up. It's also a reality that Uh, ice is melting and if you look at Greenland we know that Greenland for example is losing something in the region of 250 cubic kilometres of ice every single year. Uh, We know that because Greenland is losing weight. Scientists have got two satellites up in space called GRACE which are a pair of satellites that experience or feel the magnetic, that feel the gravitational effect of the Earth, so the more that bits of the Earth weigh beneath them, the more gravity there is pulling on the satellite. And because they're separate pairs of, there are separate pair of satellites, one accelerates a little bit ahead of the other one, and the distance between them gets very slightly larger. And that distance increasing can be used to calculate how much more mass there is on the ground. And so ice melting means that the Earth loses a bit of mass locally, and as a result, the satellites don't get so far apart and scientists can work out Greenland's rate of weight loss, and it's pretty prodigious. That's enough to put sea levels up by half a millimetre to three-quarters of a millimetre all around the planet every year. 
If you're enjoying Ask the Naked Scientist, then you might like to check out The Naked Scientist, our regular roundup of the world's best science. Each week, we take a look at the latest science news, talk to top researchers working at the coalface of discovery, and also get our hands dirty with a science experiment that you can join in with too. So make it a date and prepare to strip down science on the web at nakedscientist.com slash podcast. We've got Tony on the line. Hello to you. Hello. Hello, how are you? You're through to Dr Chris. What's your question, Tony? Right. Um, Very simple. How do dogs tell the time? They do it very similarly to the way that actually most animals do. And in fact, plants also tell the time. Uh Pretty much everything that's alive on Earth has an ability to recognise time. Even bacteria can tell the time. Now, if we use humans as an example, because they've been really well studied, but the same is true for pretty much everything, the way in which humans do it is that we have a part of our brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, SCN for short, and this is a clutch of nerve cells. There's a few thousand nerve cells in there in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And what this does is these cells are all interconnected and they have genes that turn each other on in a sort of molecular domino effect so one gene turns on and this turns on another gene and that turns on a third gene which actually turns off the first and second gene and turns on a fourth gene and the fourth gene turns on a fifth gene and that shuts off the other genes and this whole thing goes round in a circle and it takes about 24 hours to do it and as these genes turn each other on and off they alter the behavior of these nerve cells in the suprachiasmatic nucleus and that then sends the signals of what time it is to the rest of the brain and it also signals to the pituitary gland which is dangling down below the brain on a a little stalk uh, to release various chemicals and hormones into the bloodstream including one called ACTH which triggers the release of another hormone called cortisol and that then goes round in the bloodstream and informs every other cell in the body what time it is. And in recent years scientists have discovered that pretty much every cell in the body that they've studied, with maybe one or two exceptions, actually keeps time. They have the same clock running in every single one of those cells, and all of those cells are like slave clocks set by the master clock in the brain. So the obvious question is, what sets the master clock? And the answer is that scientists in the last six or seven years have discovered that there is a specialised cell in the back of the eye and it's a kind of what's called ganglion cell, which has a very special receptor molecule in it. It's an optic pigment called melanopsin, and this is very sensitive to just blue light. And it can't tell you what you're seeing. Blind people keep their body clock in trim perfectly, um, even though they can't see anything necessarily, because this special cell only tells the body clock when it can see light. So that's how the body clock resets itself. It uses light coming in through the eyes, through this special clutch of cells, to reset the clock. And that's why when you go and get jet lagged on holiday, you can still get your clock right afterwards and you get over your jet lag. And every animal we study has pretty much the same sort of system. Even coral uses some of the same genes to to keep its body clock so it can synchronise its spawning and all that kind of thing. And in plants, although they don't have the same system that we do, they have a very similar mechanism. So it's a bit like a clock with different numbers of cogs, but they still connect together a bit like a primitive genetic gearbox. And that's how plants keep time too. The reason being that it can make a huge difference to how successful you are as a species. If a plant puts its leaves out, grows and puts fruit out at the wrong time of year when there's no pollinators and no one to spread the seeds around, it's not going to be very successful. Likewise, if an animal wakes up, goes out in the daytime and gets eaten by another animal when it's got very poor vision, that would be bad too. Humans, very good vision. We want to be out during the daytime uh, because we can use the power of our very good vision to see things, find food and protect ourselves. We want to be asleep at night time when we're pretty powerless to defend ourselves against predators. So that's why the body clock evolved and basically that's how it works. Amazing. Tony, thanks ever so much, Addy Bun. Take care. And you dear. Bye. Okay, bye bye, bye bye. Um, let's go to Ace's question now. Why do veg lose their crispiness after being frozen, Chris? This effectively comes down to the same reason that you put antifreeze in your car on a cold winter like we're having at the moment, because when ice crystals form in an enclosed space, they exert pressure on the tubes and pipeworks in your car, and that pressure can cause those things to rupture. 
A vegetable is not much different. It's got lots of little tubes and cells and structures inside itself, which are bags of water. And if you put the vegetables in the freezer, the water inside the cells forms spiky ice crystals that then rupture the cells, and it also can damage the cell walls, which give the uh, particular piece of fruit tissue or vegetable tissue its turgor, its stiffness. So when you then thaw it out, because the ice is now gone and the ice was what was holding it stiff in, in the freezer, now you've turned a whole bunch of very delicate cells, which were little bags of enclosed fluids, into broken bags, a bit like a, str a string vest. And so all the water just sort of flops out of them, and they've lost all that stiffness. And many people have tried very hard for a long, long time to develop sort of fruit antifreeze, um, the idea being that you could prevent the ice crystals forming big, sharp crystals inside cells and breaking them open. They've gone some way towards doing this. They've found certain chemicals or certain patterns of freezing, which if you freeze at a certain rate, you can affect the, the way in which the ice crystals form and how large they become. Um, but it's still not perfect. And things like strawberries and raspberries still, unfortunately, they lose that beautiful, fresh, crunchy flavour as soon as you freeze them. We can't beat fresh raspberries, can you? They're lovely. Now, Jack in Cambridge uh, just wonders about uh, the universe. If it keeps expanding, wouldn't it eventually create a vacuum which would suck everything back in again? Interesting question. Chris? No. Um, Isaac Newton, when he was doing his work in Cambridge, a long while ago now, but his view was that the universe was static. And then Edwin Hubble came along, and he made some very interesting uh, discoveries, and that's why we have the Hubble telescope named after him. And his initial finding was that space is expanding. And if you look at distant objects in space, they're moving away from us. They're so-called red-shifted, because the light from them to us is being stretched out by the expansion of space. And if you look at things that are further away, they're being stretched out away from us even faster. So, in other words, the, 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 as space is expanding and growing, it's, it's speeding up. The rate of expansion of the universe is accelerating. No one could really understand what was doing that, but in recent years, this entity called dark energy has been defined. And it's called dark because no one knows what it is. But it accounts for about 75% of the mass of the universe. So the stuff we can see, the matter, the things that the universe is visibly made of, accounts for about 4.5-5%. There's also an entity called dark matter, which is stuff we can't see, but which is gravitationally active, and that accounts for about 20%. That leaves a massive 75% of the mass of the universe unaccounted for. This is this dark energy. It seems to be created when space gets created, and therefore the more space there is, the more dark energy there is, and therefore the current prediction is that the universe will continue to expand indefinitely. There's not going to be any great suck that squashes everything back together again, as far as we can tell at this time. All right, well, let's hope not, anyway. Uh, not in our lifetime, anyway. No, let's I hope we're not. we're all right. Oh, good, that's all right. Uh, an interesting question here um, from uh, Mike in Colchester. With all the melting snow, will it have a beneficial effect on our water tables? Chris? The bottom line is that we think the Earth is going to have quite a big problem with water in the future. Now, we're not talking next year, potentially, but we are talking in our lifetimes, potentially. Uh, what the predictions show is that some bits of the Earth are going to get a lot wetter. Other bits of the Earth are going to get a lot drier. But the areas that are going to get wetter are not the areas at the moment that need the rain, and the areas that are going to get uh, drier are not the ones that are flooded at the moment either. So, in other words, the amount of land that is livable and viable to farm and will be farmable is going to decline. So what we think will probably happen in the UK uh, is that it will probably get drier down south and the traditional cottage garden could become a thing of the past and we'll have to start growing plants and things that are much more tolerant of conditions more akin to what you probably get in, in uh, some dry bits of the Mediterranean. The other thing that's possibly going to happen is that we could end up with um, a very cold winter because it sounds counterintuitive that if global warming kicks in, temperatures go down. But one prediction is that the, at least initially, melting of the polar ice cap as the Arctic ice melts, this influx of fresh water will divert the Gulf Stream, which is this band of warm water which arises in the Gulf of Mexico and it comes north and it delivers energy at the same rate as if we had a million gigawatt power stations along the coast of the UK. That's how much heat this thing brings to the coast of the UK every year. If we didn't have that, 
the winters are predicted to be three or four degrees C colder every year, which doesn't sound like much, but it is actually very, very uh, significant when you consider that's the difference between a blizzard and a rainstorm. Wow, quite something. All right, let's uh, go to um, an email again now. Uh, it's Lynn this time who's emailed in to say, does cracking your knuckles cause arthritis? And we're all guilty of it. You can't help yourself, can you? <laughs> like, you know, just pulling them out and that used to do it at school. <laughs> so, Chris, will it, will it give us arthritis if we crack our knuckles? Well, uh, amazingly, people have done studies on this. Um, why do knuckles crack? What's going on, first of all, is when you apply tension to your finger, you are basically removing pressure from the joint space and the joint consists of a fluid a bag of fluid which is surrounded by ligaments so when you pull on the joint you reduce the pressure inside the joint and this enables a bubble of gas which is dissolved in the joint fluid to pop into existence that bubble when it pops into existence causes all the ligaments around the edges of the joint to pop outwards they go snap and that's the first click you get and then what happens is that the bubble when you squeeze the joint again and you say bend your fingers the bubble collapses in on itself and at the same time this pulls all of the ligaments that have been popped out of the joint back in again and that's the second snap that you hear the amount of energy that the bubble unleashes when it does that is only about we think seven to ten percent of the amount of energy we would predict you would need to damage cartilage the stuff that smooths over the tops of the bones and makes the joints move easily so we don't think in the short term it's going to be that bad what about those studies? Well, there was a guy, and I don't know how he came to do this, but there was a guy called Daniel Unger, who for 50 years cracked the joints of his left hand, but he didn't crack the joints of his right hand. And he wrote about himself saying, I haven't got any difference in arthritis between the two hands. Now, an N of one, one case, you'd be very cautious how you interpret that. So you need big numbers. Luckily, in walks two researchers, there's George Castellanos and there's also uh, David Axelrod and they, they published a paper, this pair, uh, it must be more than 10 years ago now and what they did was to look at 300 people who had been uh, knuckle crackers or not and what they found is the people who had cracked their knuckles for many years uh, did not have any excess of arthritis in their joints but interestingly what they did have is a small reduction in strength of their grip so in other words, if, when, if you wanted to open that jar of jam or pickled onions, these guys would find it more difficult, but the, act, the actual act of cracking knuckles didn't seem to have triggered a decrease in uh, anything other than grip strength, and it hadn't triggered arthritis. Wow, I've just been cracking mine after that. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. Uh, time for one or two quick more questions. Kathy in Havehill says, Chris, you say the universe is expanding and continues to expand, but in expanding into what? into nothing because nothing exists until the universe exists because the universe by definition is everything so the universe isn't actually expanding into anything it's just that everything that exists is getting bigger um, that's a bit of a get out answer uh, because our brains are basically evolved to see things that we can live in and be contained within and when you try and grapple with higher dimensions because we live in a three-dimensional uh, world with the fourth dimension being time we really are not neurologically equipped unless you're Stephen Hawking to cope with perceiving these higher dimensions and so it's very hard for us to understand well what do these additional dimensions mean and therefore what can the universe be other than this thing that must be expanding into something else and and it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Mm. I don't understand it. Well, lastly, Isabel in Cambridge says, if Neptune is made of water, why doesn't it drip? Well, Neptune's a gas giant, actually. Um, it's, it's a slightly smaller version of Jupiter and Saturn. So when planets uh, first formed around the Sun, there were lots and lots of gases and things that all accreted together. Some of them were bigger than others, and some of them were big enough to hang on to gases that were light, like hydrogen. And so there's enormous amounts of very light gases like hydrogen on Jupiter and Saturn and, and Neptune. Because they're so big, they've managed to hang on to it and they haven't got too much input of energy from the sun to, to blow it all off either. That's it for this week. Our doctors will be back with me next week for more Ask the Naked Scientist. But don't forget you can also catch them on the Naked Scientist podcast, which you can find on the Naked Scientist website, www.nakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientists comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientists.com.